Hi everyone, it's Plastic EP here from Melbourne, Australia, and I've got the fabulous Bill Lars coming in live. How are you, Bill? Hello there, nice to be here. Me too. Tell me now about Monkey Mania and tell me about your musical career with uh, what you do in music. It's fascinating. Oh. Okay, well, I mean, just to give the background, which will help understand what I did for Monkey Mania, um, I have a music education degree and a communications degree from, from a couple of colleges, and I taught public school music for 34 years and was fortunate enough to be able to retire, retire a few years ago. Um, so back in 1982, uh, Charles, was, Charles Rosnay was uh, putting together a uh, monkeys convention to be held in Bridgeport. And yeah. before that, there had been some monkey conventions in Trenton, New Jersey, but Charles always shoots for the stars and this was gonna be much bigger and, and much more worthwhile. Uh, so right off the bat, uh, the year before, Charles and I went out to Long Island to see Peter Tork play uh, in a band with the new monks. And we got to meet him and talk with him and invite him to the show. Now, he was going to be a paid guest. And, you know, Charles took care of all that stuff. But I was just thrilled to meet my first monkey and get something autographed. And he was, he was very nice and very gracious. And uh, so, as a matter of fact, when the day came, he was there for the uh, Sunday only of the three-day convention. And... Uh, I got to go to New York and pick him up from his then girlfriend's apartment and bring him back to Connecticut. So I had I had a couple hours with just Peter and another young lady in the car just to just to talk about everything. Um, when he saw me going into um, Monkey's direction, he said to me, and I, I then I had to kind of end it. He said, "Bill, you know what it was like being in the Monkeys and being asked about it. It's like being asked what you did in third grade." So I said, oh, okay, oh, back, out, back out for the monkeys uh, questions here. And, uh, you know, uh, he'll, get plenty, he'll get monkeyed enough at the convention. So we brought him down. And uh, prior to that show, Charles wanted to form a monkeys tribute band. And uh, he was going to play the Davy part and just kind of jump around and uh, play the tambourine and maracas. And, and he, is, he is a wonderful front man for a band. He has that energy that, that comes across to the audience and, and the audiences love it. And then he's charisma. gone on to be he's a, got that charisma. Yeah, exactly. And he went on to be an award winning DJ uh, in the New Haven, Connecticut area here in the States. So, I mean, it's uh, this this was a while ago. But in any case, uh, I was the music director and played bass or keyboards. Um, John Sheridan, who through no fault of his own, wore his hair and bore a resemblance to the 60s Michael Nesmith with the part in the hair, the sideburns, not that he was a dead ringer for him, but you could believe he would be in a monkey's tribute band. So he, he was our Mike. Uh, Charles was Davey. I was Peter. And we had um, another young high school kid, uh, John Harris, I think his name was. And he was our, he was our drummer. So the highlight of it for me was on Sunday with Peter there, he got up on stage and we played a few songs. He sat down behind the keyboard. I went back to bass and it was thrilled to say I backed Peter Tork for a couple of songs. Um, I didn't get a chance to drive him back to New York, but uh, it was a wonderful day. And I think most people that were there will remember it for his response to the question, uh, where, where, do, where were you when you heard John Lennon died? And he was home watching ABC Monday Night Football, like so many people here in the States. And Howard Cosell came on with the announcement a little past 1030. Uh, and at that time, we just knew he had been shot and was en route to Roosevelt Hospital in New York City. And he was pronounced dead, give or take, about 11 o'clock. So before he had even gotten to the hospital, it was on the news wires already. And then, of course, the news came a little after 11, and, you know, that was the end of that dream. Um, 
So I, I was uh, pleased many, many years later, Charles did a rock expo convention. And there were a lot of different rock stars from the 60s and 70s and 80s there. And he got Peter to come. Uh, you know, you get paid to be a convention guest. You pose for pictures. You sign things, you know, whatever. And uh, I got to spend a day with him doing promo at radio stations in New York City. So we kind of uh, re reunited our acquaintanceship uh, from all those years earlier. And I felt much more comfortable talking to him this time. Uh, I think what uh, made him at ease is I didn't start off talking about monkeys. I started off talking about guitars. And that must have been an hour of our trip to New York City. We, we, were, we were just talking one guitar or another. He, he's a collector to a certain extent. I'm a collector to a certain extent. And it was just uh, thrilling to talk about guitars. Plus... Uh, plus a guitar slash banjo store that he frequented that I knew had recently burnt down and he was not aware of that. So I had to tell him that, uh, yeah, one of his favorite places where he recently purchased a, a banjo yeah, is no more. So, uh, but uh, I felt in the few times I saw Peter after that at various conventions, he, again, he was always very gracious to me. Uh, he had a hard time with my driving. I, I drive a five speed and he, and it's, and it's a Honda Accord. So it, most Honda Accords don't have five speeds, but mine does because that's how I learned to drive. And I'll, I'll always own a car with a five speed. Uh, so every time I shifted, of course, you know, the car, the car jiggles a little bit and he just wasn't used to that. So he nicknamed me Lurch. Because it was like I was going faster than slower, faster than slower. So uh, those, those are the things I'll remember about Peter. He was a nice guy. He was a brilliant musician. Uh, I am hoping history remembers him for more as time went on than just his role in the Monkees. Uh, all he ever wanted to do was play music. And, and I find that quote again and again and again, no matter what, what I read about him on, online, all he lived for was making music. Well, he was so I've rambled multi, on. What next? He was a multi-instrumentalist. Uh, he could play anything. Yep. Yep. And uh, I, he, he also loved to perform. I think he really found his um, his dream towards the end of his life when he had blue suede shoes, uh, shoe suede blues, uh, his blues band. He really, at some point in his life, discovered the blues and started to look into it as an historian as an, and as a player. And he loved uh, just making music and playing with his blues band. I, I, I think he would have done it for free. Fantastic. You know, I know Fred Valdez. He was at one of those things, wasn't he? Fred Velez? Oh, yeah. Fred's, Fred's a uh, uh, one of the regulars, let's say. Yeah. If he, if he can make it and get transportation, he's been to every monkey convention or show that Charles has ever put on. He's a great guy, too. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. I wish him well. I know his health is not the best these days. Uh, he was... Uh, Charles recently did uh, a, a convention in memory of Peter Tork back in February. Uh, not only a year since Peter died, but also his, his birthday month. And uh, yeah, Fred unfortunately couldn't make it due to, due to health problems, uh, but he did send a nice video message along talking about Peter. Yep. Uh, I love Fred. Uh, we have certainly hung around at the various conventions over the years. He, he's a very special guy in, in his book that he wrote uh, about the post monkeys and the name of it escapes me right now uh, is a book that all monkey fans, you know, you know, the story of the monkeys or if you're a fan and you don't know it by now. You... That's right. And also he's done a lot. I don't know. You're in the wrong place, but uh, it's the. Yes. Yep. Yeah, uh, you know, as I said, his book is all post monkeys, which is great. Yeah, I think he even worked for Davey for a while, kind of going through his archives in Beavertown, Pennsylvania, and kind of putting things in order. So, yeah, uh, yeah he Indeed. made quite a few visits to, to Beavertown. 
Exactly, he did. But, I mean, playing with uh, Peter, that must be fantastic, but also driving him and spending time with him, that must have been a big buzz. What did he like on the radio? Um, well, you know, with playing with Peter, uh, fortunately, it was in the, the same key. Or it was a key that he felt comfortable singing in. So we didn't have to do any key changes at the last second. And I knew both the keyboard and the bass part. So it really went off without a hitch. Uh, John, the guitar player, knew it. And uh, Charles helps with percussion and a little bit of background vocals. Well, you can't get better than that. To spend time with Peter and talk monkey stories. And I want to say, Bill, it's been fantastic having you. On the show, any links or anything people can find you on the net? Well, uh, the easiest is uh, my email, and I don't mind giving that out. It's billlast at att.net. In the Bill Last part, you need all three L's, B-I-L-L-L-A-S-T. Uh, I'm working on a Beatles videography guide, which I hope to have done by the end of next year. I've, I've finished the Beatles. Paul, George, and Ringo. I only have John left. And then we'd love to come back on your show and talk about it. Please do, Bill. Just send me a text and you're on. I'll be fascinated in knowing about that. I actually reckon the monkeys need to put out a DVD where they've got the old film clips and the sound has been redone from the recordings, similar to ABBA. ABBA's got one of the best DVDs of all their songs. Okay. They need to do that with the monkeys. Well, Rhino's uh, ep complete episode, television special, and movie box with the audio and Blu-ray is probably the best sounding one out there. Totally agree. They did a fantastic job there. Andrew Sandoval did a top job. But what yes, I'm he saying, did, huh? you need a I've separate only, DVD yeah, I've only, of just songs. Yeah. Well. Who knows? That, that's how they keep us buying the same music again and again and again. They keep remastering and remastering and remastering. <laughs> and they, right. know us, they know us monkeys fans will go out there and buy it. And, and, they're, and they're, they're very smart keeping it to limited editions because they don't lose a lot of money. And the people that are really follow the monkeys uh, will get on it as soon as it's offered. And they, they pay for it, and they get it, and they're very happy with it. And they are fantastic products. Everything Rhino puts out, they take a lot of time and effort, as you know yourself. They spend so much yep. time that the money that you pay, for example, to get all the TV shows on Blu-ray or on DVD, whatever it is. I know it's Blu-ray. The amount of time and effort goes into mastering yep. has got nothing to do with the cost. The cost... It's just a token. It just right. Like, they do it right. That's right. They do a proper professional job. So here, here's my wish for Rhino. The next Monkeys Deluxe box should be headquarters. Uh, trouble being, they already have a two-disc Deluxe headquarters out there. And years ago, they put out a... I think it was a three-disc monkey session, but it was very, very limited and very expensive back in the early 80s, I think it was, um, and uh, or early, uh, early 90s when, when computers were just kind of coming in. And they should reissue all that stuff because most monkey fans don't know about it or didn't have computers back then, and that would be a very nice box for them to put out. Thank you so much, Bill, for your time today. And I'm sure they'll be watching this interview and listening to what you have to say. Thanks again, Bill. Very it's good. I salute you, my friend. Be well. Me too. Anderson, keep me in touch with your videography, okay? Will do. Thanks, Bill. See ya. Take care.